and welcome to PM Personality Profile. My name is Nana Ansakwao the Fourth. And as usual, at the end of the week, we always find that one person who was who's a great achiever, whose life is worthy of emulating, and then we profile them. But particularly, I get excited if the person is a woman. Why? Because uh, societies, you know, whereas a man would take two steps and get recognized, the woman will probably have to take 20 to get the same recognition, or sometimes even less. So when it gets to the point when you're going to recognize a woman, you must know that she has gone the long haul. And this is one great woman who has indeed done it. Don't go away when I come. Well, thank you very much for staying. And our guest tonight is well, Ambassador Dr. Margaret Amwakohile. Uh, she is the head of Department of Communication Studies, University of Ghana, and also a member of the Council of State, former High Commissioner to Canada. And that's just a few of the accolades of this wonderful woman who says, uh, whatever a man can do, women can do better. <laughs> <laughs> Doc, well, thank you for squeezing us in in your busy shadow. We are grateful. You're welcome. But as usual, I always want to go all the way back to Seri, BA. You know, well before the Legon Ambassador days, all the way to Seri. No, Paint Sefri. a little bit. Wenchi. Wenchi. Thank you, Wenchi. Paint a little picture about, about Wenchi. Well, I was born in Wenchi. I don't come from Wenchi, though. Okay. I come from Nsoko, mm -hmm. which is the capital town of the district named as Thai. Okay. Ghanaian say Tain, but it's Thai. Thai district capital, that's where I come from. Okay. But I was born in Wenchi, started school in Wenchi, and I've been going up and down. Mm. Wenchi, Nsoko, Sunyani, then finally Tamale. Wow, before, further up. <laughs> oh, yes. Before I ended up at uh, St. Francis Secondary School, Jirapa, in the Upper West region. It used to be Upper Region then, mm -hmm. but it's not Upper West region. So. Was your father a teacher, policeman, priest? Interestingly, no. As we say, none of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Why were my you father, My father used to be a bailiff okay. at the court. And then when we got to Tamale, he saw an opportunity to join Electricity Company of Ghana. Mm -hmm. okay, so... All the roaming about was because he was a bailiff. But he was in Wenchi and then he got transferred to Sunyane. But in between, I think when I was in class two, for some reason he just decided I should live with his mother. So I went to Nsoko to live with my grandmother, Athena grandmother, for one year. And then he brought me back. Then he was in Sunyane. And then after class three, he took me back for class four, and then for some reason he brought me back class five. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but uh, I think along the line somebody told him, you know, if you leave this girl with your mom, she'll end up being a rotten girl. You know how grandmothers yeah. don't really, they, they yeah. just pamper. So she, he took me away and that was the end. And so I was with my parents. in Sunyane up to, I think, middle school from one. Then he got transferred to Tamale. Okay. So that's why I ended up in Tamale. I see. Uh, and mom, what was mom doing? Mom was a petty trader. Okay. Mm. Father was middle school living certificate holder. Mommy was no certificate. And so uh, she did everything. Everything to ensure that there was food on the table. And so selling anything that could be sold and all that. And learned many things as well. Wow. And in being the, the, her first child, I always learned those things with her as well. So. Many siblings? Yes. My mom has six. I'm the first. Oh, responsibility. Double. Oh, a lot of responsibility. <laughs> but I enjoy those responsibilities, you know, because... I, you get to bully them. <laughs> not only that. The bullying, it just comes naturally. <laughs> but, you know, um, everybody calling you a sister, and it just gives you some... And sister that has meaning, yeah. you know. Uh, they need something, they want to come to sister, and you know. Each time, I mean, I have two brothers in Accra, when they get in here, the first thing they do is to go check what is in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> sister, then they will feed you. They don't even ask. <laughs> they just go and open. And if they don't find anything, then they are so there's nothing in this house. <laughs> so you have to look for something for them. So it's, it's enjoyable. 
So when at, at which stage did you come back south? Because all this time you're you know middle to north. Yes, I actually left my parents in the north and came down south. Because when I went to St. Francis Secondary School, mm. I finished form five and then came to St. Louis in Kumase, okay. sixth form. Then from St. Louis to Accra, <laughs> to the University <laughs> of Ghana, Legon. And my parents were still in Tamale, so. I see, I see. Did, did you ever join them or then that was it, that was your? Uh, each time I went on vacation, I said I was going home, it was Tamale I was going to. And then when I finished school, first degree, did national service on campus, then almost immediately got into graduate school, and then from graduate school to teaching. So I didn't quite live with them again, but I was visiting. Visiting. Mm. When, by the time you got to Lagos, what, what, was, what was the ambition? You know, look, I'm going to be an account ambassador, I'm going to be a council of state member. <laughs> you know, strange, when I was rather in secondary school, I had this huge ambition to become Ghana's Minister of Foreign Affairs. I don't know what it meant. But I think the, 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 the idea of maybe traveling out was fascinating. Mm. But that whole um, ambition fizzled out when that 79 coup was made and people were tied to the stake and shot. I said, no, 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 if this is all that being a minister entails, then please don't count me out. So I actually went out of politics completely. Wow. I just didn't think about politics at all until much, much, much later. later. Mm. Did, you, did you double in student politics a bit then? Or? No. Actually, what I was doing in secondary school was I was in almost every club. Oh. <laughs> every club. Debating club, geography club. Geography was a subject I really hated, but I was in the club. <laughs> then history club and everything club, I was there. But, uh, I don't know. And of course, of course, yes, let me say yes, because I was also part of the student uh, representative council along the line. Okay. I, of course, we got punished along the line for something. So it's not one of the things mm -hmm. I want to recall, <laughs> you know. After, uh, after politics, you know, left because of the coup and everything, then teaching came or? Teaching, how did it come? When I finished national service, in the course of doing national service, there was a professor who was around where I was doing national service on campus. And then we went into a conversation and then he said, you know, his daughter needed help with French. I had done French and Spanish. So I said, oh, I was still fresh with French. So <laughs> I helped her and she passed the exam. So he actually liked me. But then he asked me, what will you want to do after national service? I said, I have no idea. I just came to the university because it was natural progression from one level to the other, but I have no idea. Then he said, you know, you, and my job at the time was editing theses and um, articles and things for publication. And so he said, well, looking at what you're doing, I think you'll be good at Paul Anson's school. So this was a school of communication studies. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I don't know what they do there. He said, I'll talk to Paul. So go and have a discussion with him. So this is how I ended up at the school of communication studies. Okay. And even over there, I remember one day Professor Anza asking me, so what do you want to do after school? I said, I don't know. I'll just go and look for a job as a PR person somewhere, and then that's it. Then he said, won't you want to teach? And then I said, Prof, actually I was a bit naughty when I was a student, so I would want to taste it. So I wanted to teach. In fact, I wanted to do so as a national service woman. Okay. I didn't get that. So maybe teaching for a couple of years, and I told him, then I'll go and look for a better job. <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me and said, I will but them. <laughs> you think what I'm doing is not yeah, a, a good a job? job? <laughs> I said, well, that's your choice. Yeah. But, but anyway, this is how I ended up teaching, and I must say it's been a very enjoyable journey. So you, you, you fell in love one, once you went into it? Yes, because you know, interacting with people is, is, is great. Mm. And interacting with them in a way that imparts something to them is even greater. Mm. And then I realized that I had to learn much more than I did when I was a student. Much, much, much more. So what I just said, if I had learned all these before the exams, I'm sure they would have been begging me for A's, you know. <laughs> but um, 
it was exciting to keep on learning in order mm -hmm. to impart that knowledge. And then also to meet, with, and especially graduate school, mm -hmm. you're meeting with different people at different times, and including some who were your seniors when you were in secondary school, and those who were your mates when you were doing your first degree, mm -hmm. and now you are their teacher, and it's like, <laughs> it's, it's fun. So I, I wouldn't trade teaching for any other job. Of course, but for the salary. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you know you being around but you always come back to post oh yes oh yes you know people were asking me when I was uh, um, well, appointed a member of the council of state they said oh my own son said ma so you're leaving Legon I said no I'm not he said why I said why should I work here for over 20 years and then just when it's about time for me to retire I live unceremoniously. I don't want to do that. So it's tiring, I must say, but I said, no, I will still continue. I have just about two years, a little over two years to retire, so why not? When does the High Commissioner, you came back? Oh, yes, after High Commissioner came back. You know, when they wrote to us and said, well, you know, after the change of government, mm -hmm. we all knew we were coming back. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was at home in Ghana when this happened, and they didn't give us any letters, so we had to go back to post. And then when we got there, just about a month, they wrote and said, yeah, we are calling you. So I wrote to Legon and I said, you know, I've taken a leave of absence. I'm coming back. I'm sure they will. Oh, immediately. <laughs> my, my department, I don't know how they did. They just, I got a letter saying that you're welcome back. So I got back on, uh, it was a Sunday, 15th of February. The next day I was in class. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I was in class. I, I didn't want to lose touch. I was in class. There, there was not much teaching for me to do because they already started the semester. Mm -hmm. But I did a lot of uh, supervision and uh, examining of thesis. And so I was back to my job. Wow. Mm. Now let's rewind back. We'll come back here. But during the 79 coup, you know, during the uh, Rollins era, you, know, you were very vocal. Uh, why did you get that? I could, could draw from. You know, I told you I had an ambition which was virtually quenched by the 79 coup. Mm. And then we thought that it was, they said it was house cleaning, four months. So we returned to normalcy, everything was fine. And then in a twinkle of an eye, he's back. I said, okay. You know, I don't, I don't want to be compelled to do things. Mm. You need to let me know why I should do what I have to do. But to live under a regime that was almost as if we didn't have any brains. Somebody had to tell you what you should do. And then you should do this and people have to sleep at six o'clock and wake up. I mean, it was so frustrating. Mm -hmm. Then we thought it was going to be short-lived. But even though it was provisional, you know it took 11 years. I don't know what else, how else to spare provisional. <laughs> Okay, nearly, and, nearly so it, and so it got to a point where it was as if, you know, somebody had to rise up and say, you know, enough is enough. It was as if, in fact, there were no men in this country. <laughs> everybody was just obeying rules. Weren't your family members say you Everybody knew? was scared. But how did I get into it? Somebody from GBC gets in touch with a, a colleague of mine and says, you know, I'm looking for ladies. Because I think they felt that ladies, uh, the regime had a soft spot for ladies, and mm -hmm. therefore they wouldn't do the things they do to men, to ladies. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm looking for ladies from the university who would be on this show and do this. And initially I said, you know, I don't waste my time. I just want to take care of my three children and live in peace. And then they kept insisting. I said, okay, let's try it and see. And then we tried, and the feedback was such that you, are, you had become the voice of, of so many people in this mm. country. And so he said, why should I disappoint them? So that is how it came. Wow. And, well, I, and almost all of us who appeared on the program, we spoke our minds, okay? Sometimes it was scary. Scary to the point that family, friends, I had one of the friends uh, I made when I was in St. Francis Secondary School, one year my senior, come to lie on my carpet pleading with me that I have children, I should be concerned about my children, their future, blah, blah, blah. I said, you know what? That's why you're my friend. If I die, take care of them. But somebody has to say that enough is enough. And it's okay that it's falling on some of us to do that. 
uh, have we kept quiet about that era? Because, like, you know, children of today who have radio stations and TV stations, uh, have we hidden that history from them that, look, there was a time when, you know, you did not have this freedom? You know, you know when you don't live through an experience, you don't quite get it. Mm. Some of them, well, they've heard about it, they've read about it, but they didn't know how intense it was and how suffocating that environment mm. was. So I remember my own kid brother, my mother's last born, mm. who, who is like a son to me, I, mm. I took care of him and everything. One day I read something in the Crusading Guide, Kogubago's newspaper. And then he came to me and said, sister, this is happening. I said, what is it? You know, they used to have this thing of yearly reproducing this handing over between Rollins and Liman. And so, ah. so he handed over to Liman and then he came back and uh, over, over. I said, well, that's what happened. He said, but how did it happen? I said, it happened in this country. <laughs> so I said, initially I was saying, why would they keep on telling us this story every year? But I said, oh yeah, it makes some sense why mm -hmm. they should tell us. But the other people, you shouldn't fault them. These are young people who grew up and for a very long time knew only one leader. Mm. Okay, so all those who were born after 1979, even after 1980, who do they know? Until recently, there was nobody. And so that is their icon. Mm. And everything they learned was from what the system was teaching them, good or bad, mm. you know. So that's the kind of, of, of thing that we have lived through. Uh, those of us who lived through, it wasn't pleasant. And I always tell people, none of my relatives was killed. None of them suffered because of really, they live in their <laughs> village in peace, so there's nothing. But it didn't mean that I shouldn't empathize. You know, mm -hmm. I shouldn't have that feeling, especially when I go to the university, and then a colleague of mine that I got to know was, was the daughter of one of the soldiers who were killed. And that day I was so sad. I didn't know that she was, uh, she's not deceased anyway. I went to visit her in her hallway in Sabaho together. And then she had this album with a huge photograph of this military man, the whole page photograph. I said, hey, who is this Suja man that you have in here? She said, my dad. Immediately clicked. And not still being curious, I said, oh, is he at Bema Kam? He said, he's dead. So that was the end of conversation, okay? And I felt so bad asking that question, especially when, I mean, of course I didn't know. Mm. Then, I, I, then I, I, I checked her name against this man's mm. name, I said, oh yeah, as a father. You know, so you didn't have to suffer it directly to feel it. And as a country, then the question was, what were we teaching people? When somebody says that, I mean, Somebody is poor and he's blaming you for his poverty. <laughs> okay? I'm not from a rich home. I've never blamed anybody for any state that I've been in. I saw my mother selling anything that could be sold just to put food on the table. Mm. So I also knew that if you worked hard, you could move yourself out of poverty, especially when you added education to it. Mm. Okay. And so if there was any struggle, we should struggle to ensure that people got education rather than venting your anger on somebody because they are, they are rich. Do you know how they got rich? Okay. And this was the system we had. Mm -hmm. So you have a laborer who gets up and says, we know go sit down, make, we, she made them cheat we every day. And then you go and you're attacking your MD. And this is the kind of system that we have bred up to this point. And sometimes we are, is a, we are just wondering what's happening in this country. What's happening? And go and ask the farmers. When you sow something, you don't reap it that same day. You reap it much later. And so that's what some of us were thinking. Oh, this is not the kind of life that we want to live under. Yeah. Wow. You did well. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Especially when I meet people and they're saying, oh, that's you. And any time we came on TV, I had to go without breakfast. Because my wife would insist on watching you before she gives me food. And then it would be too late for me to set off. So I set off without my food. <laughs> so, uh, too bad for you. But, uh, but of course, if, if you think about today and what we've made of that breakfast show, it's just a mockery. You mm. know.
people think that they should just once they have the microphone, they should just say anything they want to say. Mm. We'll, mm. we'll come to uh, political mm. communication mm. and development. Come and defend, <laughs> defend your your thesis. My thesis. <laughs> I will so, try. So at which point did you come to Legon to start teaching? When I finished, um, okay, at the School of Communication Studies, now Department of Communication Studies, you come in at that time we came in to do graduate diploma. And then at the end of that one year, on a few months, the best students were selected to do masters, MA. At the end of that one year also, the best were still selected to do MPhil. Mm. And if you want to teach, usually it's the MPhil that you go for. Mm -hmm. And since I didn't have any objective, <laughs> they said, well, <laughs> you qualify to do that. I said, okay, let me join them. And so after the MF in the course of the MPhil, that was when Professor Hassan asked me whether I wouldn't want to teach. And I said, well, I would want to try it for a few years and do something better. Mm -hmm. And that something better has never come. So <laughs> this I got myself into teaching. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. But, but were you actively in like partisan politics? No. So no. how did you, how, how? How did you get picked and say, look, that's it, you go and... You know, it's a question that I'm still... I've been asking myself, especially from um, President Kufo's time. Hmm. The first time I met President Kufo ever in my life was in the studios of GBC. I had gone for a breakfast show, and then I was about to leave. They said, oh, please, uh, would you interview the presidential candidates for us? I said, I don't work for you. They said, we don't have anybody here to do the interview. So please, I said, OK. So at that time, I was supposed to interview President Kufu, um, Mr. Reku Brobe, and then um, President Mills. Okay. Who was he? Pre no, he wasn't president then, but candidate okay. Mills. And he did not come. So I interviewed the, the other two gentlemen. So that was the first time I met President Kufu. And apparently, he, he had been watching me on TV, and then he hugged me and said, he, he likes my contributions and autographed a copy of the NPP manifesto for me. So that was my, the first encounter with him. But I'm told he has an elephant uh, memory. Yeah. So, he does. So, he does. so maybe it just, he just remembered uh, me at the right so time. Uh, mm. Does it go to say, look, just make the preparations so that when the opportunity comes, you are there? You know, I tell young people all the time, these days they want to. Be, be, be given payment for everything that you do. Mm. And I always tell them that, you know, do what you are passionate about and do it so well that when they are looking for somebody, you are the one they look for. And that's when the payments will come. Mm. All the time we're going to GBC. GBC wasn't even paying our fuel. We fueled our own vehicles. And if I'm going to breakfast, you have to wake up at 4 a.m. Because you have to get to the studios mm around five to be able to read the newspapers and all that. And so it was a lot of work to do mm -hmm. for no payment. And along the line, I remember, was it, forgotten his name, uh, Mark, somebody. We just went to him and said, at least pay our fuel. <laughs> because we will come, but fuel the vehicles. Mm -hmm. So they started giving, I think, 40,000 cities or something. Old. So this today, four cities. Okay, so that's what they were paying. But I said, I was doing it out of passion. Mm. Out of conviction, out of the fact that I felt this was the right thing to do. And I wasn't looking at payment. So maybe that is it. But when you start asking for money, then it's like your motivation is money mm -hmm. and not the work that you have mm. to do. You know? mm. And people, if I'm paying you to do something, I want to see that thing done. But unfortunately, many people today don't think about that. that was a good advice that everybody no. should uh, take on board. When you finally got the news that, listen, I'm going to represent Ghana in Canada, I mean, that's like, whoa, me? Or you didn't have that reaction? <laughs> you know, I was, I was still at Leicester doing my PhD. Mm -hmm. But I got to a point, I said, no, I'm tired of living in the UK. So I told my supervisor, I said, Andes, fortunately, I have the first complete draft for you. We'll do the rest via internet. I don't want to live here anymore. And so, oh, but Margaret, I said, no, no, I'm going. You read through it and give me what your comments are, and then I'll get back. When I have to graduate, I'll come and graduate. I got home on Friday night. The next morning, a colleague of mine came and said, 
chief of staff is looking for you. He wants to see. I said, what, what is it about? He said, I don't know. I said, today Saturday, he said, well, you can come to his house. I said, I don't know there. He said, I'll take you there. <laughs> so we went. And then chief of staff, Kojun Pieng, said, oh, there's something I need to talk to you about. Uh, should we let him excuse us? And I said, he's my friend. So if you tell me, I'll tell him. So let him <laughs> hear from you directly. You know. So he said, well, the president, uh, I don't know whether he's your uncle or your big brother, but he says he wants you to represent him in Canada. So I should tell you to go and think about it. I said, chief, you must be kidding me. There's no thinking yeah, about it. <laughs> <laughs> this is not anything to think no, about. No. I tell him that I said, I'm grateful, God bless him. And that I'm taking this with both hands. So he said, oh, he's at a funeral. I would have called him. I said, well, it's settled. <laughs> that was something that had never crossed my mind. Mm. Because really, I'm not a diplomat. And um, it's not one of the things that an academic would be aspiring to. Mm. You know, it's, uh, but I said, okay. So that's mm -hmm. how I ended up in Canada. In Canada is uh... a friend of mine said, you know, my gear got scared. I said, why? He said, you know, this is your first attempt at diplomacy. They should have taken you to Togo or to Burkina Faso <laughs> or to Cote d'Ivoire or somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and they take you to I said, why are you doing this to me? It was the best place to go, you know. How was so, uh, diplomatic life in Canada? Uh, Actually, let, me, let me take a break here and come back and get yeah. a good... Uh, what, the, what was the transition from academia to diplomacy coming back? Wow, profiling the best, Dr. Margaret Amwakohene. What a beautiful story. But now we're going to look at the difference, the transition from, well, hardcore academia to hardcore diplomacy. Mm. I mean, it's not Togo, this is mm. Canada. Mm. You know, to begin with, I saw it as the practical side of what I've been teaching all this while, because I teach public relations. Okay, of course. And I think diplomacy, if you take away the fact that you are uh, representing your country abroad, is about public relations, mm. relating to people at different levels and knowing how to relate to those people. So for me, it was more of the practical side of what I've been teaching, and that made it much easier for me. And then also, I have an attitude to work that says that if you can't do it, don't take it. And if you take it, you must give it your full shot and do it well. So this is how I approached my work. And sometimes, I mean, looking back, I thought that, you know, I just killed myself to do too much. Because for instance, when Ghanaians are inviting you to a function, they choose what they call the long weekends, okay? <laughs> So they are inviting you to Toronto on, um, for a Saturday evening event. The next day, Sunday, they are resting. You have to travel back to Ottawa. And then the next day, you have to go to work. <laughs> so I start the week exhausted. And then also, I was well aware of the fact that I couldn't uh, depend on too many people for certain things. Mm. So sometimes, even 3 a.m., I'm up. If an idea crosses my mind, I pick my laptop and I have to type it so I don't forget it. And so it was fun. It was a lot of work, but it was also something that I really thought was, uh, was thrilling. How did the kids take it? You know, they were younger mm. than, of course, than today. Mm. My youngest was seven years old. Mm. Then uh, 7, 10, and 17 when we got in there. And, and my, 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 uh, the, the first child is still there in Canada because she was in the university when we were leaving. Okay. And so she had to complete and she's working in Canada now. But um, they liked it. Oh, okay. They liked the children really. It, it's, it's a fun place to raise children. It's, it's good. And I really love the educational system excellent educational system mm -hmm. and um, and that's where it doesn't matter whether you are poor or rich <laughs> you attend school with some of the finest in society my son's classmate was the prime minister's son they were both in a public school because over there the prime minister didn't have a right to send his son to a private school 
fix the problem. That, that was somewhere. that's what I I was I was amazed because he had two children. That was uh, Stephen Harper. He had two children, a boy and a girl at the time. I don't know whether he had mm -hmm. other children. And his son was my son's classmate, and his daughter was a year behind my daughter. And they were in public schools. So you fix the public school and you send exactly. your kids Exactly. If it's not good, it's not good for all of us. <laughs> you fix it, we will attend the same place. And I think that's something we should be thinking about. So that we don't mess up the public schools and take our children, not even to international schools, but out of the country to other schools mm. there. And I am somebody, I'm against this idea of you live in Ghana and your children are studying abroad. And I'm saying, why? Particularly if you're public office older. Exactly. Even if you're a private person, I would advise that, you know, you are not there. And you know, in the West, you have a very permissive society. Mm. And Ghanaian children, when they get there, the sky is the limit. So you sit here, you send them dollars every month, and you think they are studying. They are not. They're having fun. Okay. Me so too. unless you are so rich as to be going there almost every quarter or every month, to check on your ward, or maybe to go and live there with them. I think sometimes a risk that parents take, and they have to be careful. But going back to what we said earlier, I mean, weren't there friends and colleagues who were thinking, I mean, Canada back to Legion, why? You know, I don't know why they would think that way. Because what was I, a, a university teacher, who got elevated to diplomatic life? <laughs> I was dropped from diplomatic <laughs> life. Where should I go? Come back to my teaching. <laughs> teaching had not rejected me. So I came back. Because otherwise, what would I do? Because you've been ambassador for two and a half years, you sit back and say, you know, teaching is too much below me. No, not me. I guess if I ever become a president and the constitution allows me, and I'm not too old, after being president, mm -hmm. I'll still come find back. work. <laughs> do something <laughs> come, come back to your classroom uh, the classroom yeah <laughs> yeah you know when i was reading about you and then i read about what you wrote in your thesis i thought oh what an irony mm -hmm. uh political communication to aid nation's development so i thought i'll get you to defend your thesis because you tune in the radio every morning and every afternoon and you hear the political communication and you try to graph the, de the development with it. Where would you place it in your thesis today? First of all, I didn't quite make a linkage between political communication and uh, the development mm. per se. But I'll come back to answer mm. this question. I get really, I, I wouldn't say annoyed because I'm not annoyed. But I get frustrated that people think that, of course, because you can speak on radio in whatever language it is, you should just say anything at all that you want to say without even thinking. And the people who amaze me in the negative sense most are the, those who don't even pause to think about the question that has been asked. And they already have an opinion to express. I'm saying, but what you are saying is completely different from what is being discussed. And then people say things that they are not too sure are true. And yet they believe that once they say it, other people will believe and therefore it goes on. I don't know, but I think that we are doing a lot of disservice to ourselves and to our nation. Because for many of the people who vote, they vote based on what you tell them. Others may vote based on what they see. But there are some cases you don't see anything. You are just believing what you are being told. And then the person is lying. So the fear is that we'll get to a point where people may not find it necessary to go and queue and vote for anybody. Because the, the, what they will say is that it doesn't matter whether it's Kwesi or Zama. It's the same thing. So I won't do it. And then also you, you have all these people that uh, Rollins referred to as babies with sharp teeth. <laughs> Whose teeth are sharper than <laughs> the two-edged sword that the Bible talks about. And they think that they can just blast anybody at all mm. without any foundation. And what is more interesting, when they meet you face to face, then they want to hide. Because it looks like the, the, the radio, the television provides them with some anonymity. Mm that makes them think they can do just anything. So yes, there's a gap between all the things we are saying and what the truth situation is. But I think that being in politics doesn't mean that you should lie to get anything. 
Let people know what the facts are. You know, and I always want to use my... When I was growing up, my father was not a rich man. I told him his background is all middle school living certificate. But one thing that I would always stand up for my father is that he never lied. Mm. If you give him anything to, to save for you and you woke him up at 2 a.m., he'll go and pick it up for you. Because it's still there. The only thing today is that he's losing his, he was 80 yesterday, he's <laughs> losing his memory, so <laughs> he'll, he'll be looking everywhere for where he has placed it. But otherwise, you know, he was so honest. And I remember in Sunyana when I was pestering him to take me to an international school. Because I thought that oh, the, the, the Catholic school wasn't uh, quite good for me. So I pestered him. And now if I'm pestering you, I really do. Now I have changed. I was when I was younger. <laughs> so this man felt like he should just go and find out whether he could change schools for me. He went there. And the fee was more than his salary per month. So he came home, sat me down and said, you know, even if my salary could pay your fee, it would have meant that I wouldn't eat but they can't even pay it. So just make do with where you are. Yeah. It doesn't matter where you are. If you study hard, you can get anywhere that you want to get to. And even as a child, I thought this is somebody telling me exactly what I needed to hear. Why was I comparing myself to people who were coming from richer homes and whose parents could afford international school and extra classes and all those things? My father couldn't afford any of those things. So it was up to me to study. So did, did you realize that, uh, and I will come back for you to, you know, defend your thesis, but you realize that, you know, back then, uh, it was more possible, the, the geographical location did not hinder progress as much as it does today. Does geographical position hinder progress today? Well, if you were born in, you know, the same village you were born mm. today, and you were moving up Sunyani to Tamil, you probably will not end up in Lagos. I, I don't know whether I should say I agree with you or I don't agree with you. I think the difference is that today's youth or children live in a different environment. When I was growing up, my father didn't have a TV set. It was rare to have fine TV sets mm -hmm. around. In Sunyane, the next uh, house where there was a TV set, I always tell people it was the... It's, only on Sundays that my parents don't need to struggle to get me to go and bath in the evening. <laughs> because I want to go and watch yourself with Dazi. Oh, bra. And this man will not let you into his living room if you haven't had a bath. You have powder all over for him to know you've had a bath. <laughs> and even with all that, you will sit on the floor. But that was okay for as long as watching a bra or, or mm -hmm. Sofu Dazi. Okay. So I didn't have TV to distract me. There were no cell phones. In fact, when I went to secondary school, <laughs> I mean, we always, today we joke about it and say, you know, so assuming you left and your mother died, you wouldn't know until you came back. <laughs> yeah, because there was no phone to inform you. And I mean, from Tamale to Jirapa, it's such a wide distance that you have to travel. And those days went many vehicles. For the only time my parents sent somebody with, my mother was a baker, she later became a baker. A loaf of bread and something to bring to me. <laughs> so by the time the man got there, the, the bread had become moldy. <laughs> <laughs> Been traveling so, for days. Oh, yes. Yeah. So he said, you know, the bread is, it was moldy, so I threw it away. But anyway, this is money for you, you know. So there weren't too many distractions for us. And therefore, really, if you wanted to play, it was outdoor. Mm. Who plays and pay in the evening? So you come back home. Oh, wow. If it's soccer, you come back home. There's nothing else for you to do. You come back home. When you come back home, you finish eating. Your mother says, go and do your homework. If you don't do homework, where will you be? You'll be sitting there. And so the distractions weren't that many. Mm. Today, there are so many distractions. Apart from television, and even if when you have television in your house, your children don't want to be around with you watching television. Because they have everything on their phones. Mm. And I pity those people who buy phones for their children when they are still in the basic level. I don't. I tell my children, if you want to get a phone, you must get to secondary school. At least that's the level of maturity, mm -hmm. then get a phone. But I will not buy it for you at that level because I think that the distractions are... So this is the problem. Mm -hmm. So children don't get to devote that much time to their studies anymore. Secondly, we used to have very dedicated teachers. 
teachers who were role models, they were also like our parents. Okay, and therefore they guided us. Today, there are many in the teaching profession who are there because of the salary. Otherwise, why will any teacher absent himself or herself from school for extended periods without any reason when you know there are children for you to teach? Hmm. It doesn't make sense to me because if that's your passion and that's the, the calling you think that you've been called to do and this is what you have assigned yourself to do, then why are you not there doing it? So these are some of the problems we have today. So I don't think it's about geography as much as about the environmental changes that have happened and the fact that what used to be then is not now. Mm. And therefore, the children need to work extra hard to be able to put all the distractions away and concentrate on their studies. Hmm, point taking. So now we come back to the thesis. Yes, the yeah. thesis. What do you want to know about the thesis? How, how? I mean, what, what were you studying? What, were, what was your curiosity? My curiosity was looking at, you know, when um, Rollins became the president, he came with some baggage mm. from his AFRC days mm. to his PNDC mm. days. And, and therefore, if you compared him to Kufour, who came without that kind of baggage, the media reflected that. Okay, so essentially what I was looking at was looking at Ghana, the two years of uh, the Rawlings' period and two years of Kufo's period to compare and see whether the same newspaper covered them equally mm. or that there were some biases and, and things like that. You know, we always say that the, the state-owned media tend to be uh, aligned to governments and mm. all that. And what I found out that it wasn't exactly true. It was up to a point, but at a certain point it wasn't. And so then you needed to look beyond the media coverage and look at other environmental factors which influenced what we were looking at. So that was essentially looking at the two of them and comparing to see that this happened or this did not happen. And so I was looking at two um, state-owned newspapers and two privately-owned newspapers. And of course those days Chronicle was the newspaper <laughs> if you're talking private to look at. And the, 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 the abrasiveness and aggression and everything was captured in, in that. And sometimes I felt that they were not exactly, um, uh, what is the word? They were not exactly friendly, not friendly, but uh, charitable mm. to the Rollins regime. And Kufa had a longer holiday before people began to tighten the, the news and all that. So it was more of looking at the coverage mm -hmm. and seeing uh, the disparities and, and, and making statements that it is not always true that the state-owned media are in bed with the government. It depends on what government you are talking about. So mm -hmm. even though you may find that kind of coverage in both cases, one will be much more than the other. Okay. Okay. And then I was also interested in some of the, uh, what we call the, um, the, the descriptive words that were used to describe some of the stories that we found. So the value-laden words that were used, how strong they were in one regime as compared to the other regime, and what it told you about the attitude towards that regime. Okay. Yeah. So, but ultimately you're looking at whether that propelled us in the right direction or it brought us back, you know. Because then you are looking at Rollins, not as Rollins president from 1993 to whatever period it is, uh, 2000, early 2001. But you're looking at him as somebody who came on the scene in 1979, came back in 1981, and, in, and which was really not fair. Because if you are covering regimes as, uh, under the 1992 constitution, then you cannot study Rollins of 1979 mm. and 81. You have to start from 1993. Sure. Okay. What has been some of the highlights in your teaching career? Highlights in my teaching career? I didn't have highlights. I had, I had two children whilst I was teaching. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't get higher than that. <laughs> you know, yeah. It doesn't get higher than that. No, I had two children. But for me, my attitude was, for instance, when I had my son, I, I well, somebody, no, no, even not my son. I, in fact, all three children, I had them when I was in communication mm -hmm. studies. The first one I had them when, when I was studying, actually. Okay. When I was studying. And a week or two after, I was back in the classroom. 
Well, the lecturer said, why, you, you didn't give birth, did you? Or was it an <laughs> egg that you <laughs> dropped or something? I said, well, there, there's time for everything. The, the child, fortunately, if you have a mother like mine, mm. you never lose out because mm. she's always there to take care of them. Oh. In fact, my daughter sees her as her mother. <laughs> I am her biological mother. Mm. My mother is her mm. mother. And there's always a reason mm. because, you know, I breastfed her for six months. My mother breastfed her for one year. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's more attached to it. And if I took a doctor to tell me, you know, stop this, otherwise your mother will take all the affection from you. And she, she did take it because my daughter, anytime she hears my mother is sick, she's almost commanding me what to do for her mother and all that anyway. And then I had my son when I was teaching. And then he, he was born in June. It was this, we didn't have a very um, regular academic session because of the strikes and mm -hmm. things. So it was right in the middle of, of, of the ac academic year, the semester was at the time or something. And I didn't see how I was going to leave the students in the classroom because I've had, I've had a son. Unfortunately, I was living on campus. So you go breastfeed, you come back to the classroom. And, <laughs> and, and that's why I, I have a pain with teachers who really don't sacrifice for the students that they are teaching and actually cheat them because you are being paid to do an assignment. And then you don't do it. Mm. And you take the salary and you go away. You must find a way. I think they should be ashamed of themselves because really this is a noble profession and you're molding the lives of people. I teach graduate students. They are not kids, but they are still getting molded before they leave. Okay. And uh, I don't know if it's a highlight, I don't know. I do my job, that's all. Well, that's, uh, I think, I I think that's job. a highlight. Mm. Any, any low moment? Oh, there have been a lot of low moments in my life, low moments, many of them. But uh, each time, my God is there to provide support. Mm. When you are brought up in, in, in a faith that you get grounded in, nothing sways you. Things may come very hard, it may hit hard. You will shed a tear or two, but in the end, you are consoled because you, you see the hand of a superpower on, on you. And so tears, have, I've, I've shed tears. People, sometimes people think, my daughter will tell me, Ma, you are too hard. I said, I'm hard, but I cry sometimes. You don't even know. I cry. But after crying, I just tell myself, this can be done, this can be fixed. That's an inscription on your wall. I noticed it when I came in, it says, I know just can't tell you again, you know, basically saying that God can do everything. Yes. I didn't put it there. Oh, okay. my, my, my last child, ah. she's in second year in the university. Ah. She came back from Holy Child, like an evangelist. You know, it was all over, well, even on the porch, mm -hmm. everywhere. But I think the weather beats it and mm -hmm. then you, it becomes white. You don't okay. see it anymore. She had all these inscriptions in her bedroom, everywhere, in the study, everywhere. And I said, are you becoming an evangelist? He said, man, this is what you need to know so that you get stronger in the Lord. And she, she's my evangelist. Uh, she's my evangelist. She just goes about. And anything she reads and touches her heart, she, she wants us to know, and then she writes all over. So, so this is her handiwork. I see. I told her to get rid of all those that are faded and we can't see anything. So <laughs> <laughs> or she should replace them. <laughs> Your final word for, for young ladies some empowering words of wisdom, mm -hmm. what should they do? First of all, the Bible says there's time for everything. Young ladies should know when they should be learning, whether it's apprenticeship or in school, wherever you are, and they should learn and learn it so well that even if it's whatever it is that you are doing, you'll be the number one in what you're doing. That's the first thing I tell them. Secondly, one of the days when our mothers used to tell us, oh, uh, so that if you get some responsible man to marry, there's no responsible man anywhere. <laughs> He's as responsible as you are. Mm -hmm. And therefore, and these days, the men are rather looking for women who are... Responsible. I tell you. <laughs> so, so tell yourself that you want to make it in life. You get a responsible man to marry, it becomes a plus. And it's not what will define you, because no man today can define you. Mm. But there are a lot of, the reason why many girls are not married is that a lot of the men are afraid to marry. 
You know, I have a, a, a brother at church that, you know, is a church brother, but he's almost like family. Mm. So his son, I saw a lady, I said, lady, why are you following my nephew? He said, oh, that's my boyfriend. I said, but you look older than him. Why are you following him? And so that's my boyfriend. I said, I'm telling you, this boy that I look at, he's not ready to marry today or tomorrow. So if you are thinking of marrying the next five years, you better look elsewhere. And then last week, the father came and said, you know, sister, what you told me, this girl is still falling. And this boy tells me that oh, he has 10 more years to wait. And so, uh, so uh, you know, so they are irresponsible. And therefore, if you're going to depend on people like that, I'm afraid you're not going to get anywhere. And then also to let them know that it's not marriage that defines you. Marriage doesn't define anybody. You are defined by your maker. And therefore, get get on doing what, you, what you, you know how to do best. If you don't know something, learn how to do something. Get busy with your own hands and let the, the marriage become something that supplements or complements what you're doing rather than what really makes you what you are because it cannot make you what you are. And that's when they get disappointed and then they get to the mental hospital and then all the things follow. I mean, we are too beautiful for that. And I think our mothers will want to have children who they can be proud of. Nobody is proud of a mad daughter, mm. you know, and, and therefore they need to live. They need to get a life for themselves. They need to make marriage, not the number one, but let it come when it will come, you know, and look before you leap. <laughs> look before you leap. Wasn't that pearls of wisdom? What a story, as usual. Until the next time I come to you with another personality that's been personality profile with Dr. Margaret Amwakohene. How wonderful. Doc, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. For you at home, thank you so much for watching.